Ja, guten Morgen, liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen. Einmal mehr hat die Technik einen kleinen Streich gespielt, aber dank der Unterstützung des Technikers und auch von Benedetta Folletti haben wir es doch geschafft. Ich begrüße natürlich insbesondere auch alle, die uns auf Zoom mitverfolgen, hier zu dieser besonderen Angele Chance, die wir haben, hier eben Morsegev zu begrüßen. Ich ich habe mir das so überlegt, irgendwie, wenn man zurückschaut, eben das ZAZ haben wir 2018 gegründet, das Zentrum Altertumswissenschaften Zürich. Die Hoffnungen und Erwartungen, die wir da reingesteckt hatten, waren eben die Altertumswissenschaften in Zürich zu bündeln, Zürich auch zu einer Art Hub für die Erforschung der mediterranen Antike zu machen und auch die Internationalisierung voranzutreiben. Manchmal erfüllen sich diese Erwartungen geradezu in mirakulöser Weise. Wir haben dank großen großzügige Unterstützung von verschiedenen Stiftungen und auch Privatpersonen in diesem Semester erstmals die große Chance, in Anna Schriefel eine Gastprofessorin hier zu haben. Und ihre zatz lecture war dann der Anlass, dass ich auch Mo Segev kennenlernen konnte, denn er ist zu ihrem Vortrag gekommen und wir haben uns nachher sofort blendend auch verstanden. Tatsache ist, dass ich mir sein Buch über Aristotle on Religion schon lange notiert hatte, weil ich sofort fand, das ist hochinteressant. Ich hatte aber keine Zeit, das näher anzuschauen und er ist eben jetzt, da kommen dann Zufälle, eben mirakulöse Zufälle dazu, er ist im Moment sozusagen lost in translation, denn er war vorher in Budapest am Institute for Advanced Study der European Central University und hatte dort ein Stipendium für sechs Monate, glaube ich, und weil seine Heimatsituation, also sein Heimatstaat, wenn man so sagen darf, beziehungsweise die Heimatuniversität in einem Staat ist, der sehr, sehr schwer von Covid-19 betroffen ist, konnte er jetzt nicht sofort zurückreisen, sondern ist hier in Zürich bei uns gestrandet und diese Gelegenheit konnten wir uns natürlich schlicht nicht entgehen lassen. Wenn wir den Experten für Aristoteles, einen der größten Denker der Antike, der ja insbesondere auch immer darauf aus war, Materialien zusammen sehr positivistisch auch zu arbeiten, eben alles aufzunehmen, genauso auch bei der Religion. Wir haben jetzt den Spezialisten, der den Spezialisten der Antike für all diese positivistischen wissenschaftlichen Untersuchungen selber erforscht hat, dann müssen wir ihn unbedingt hier einladen. Und wenn ich mir das überlege, passt es auch wirklich ganz hervorragend in den Ablauf der Vorlesung hinein. Wir hatten das letzte Mal ja im Zusammenhang mit der Spurensuche zwischen Antike und Gegenwart auch auf die Säkularisierung hingewiesen. Und ich habe betont, wie es in der griechischen klassischen Antike des 5. Jahrhunderts vor Christus ja durchaus Entsprechendes gegeben hat. Wenn wir an den Agnostizismus zumindest der sophistischen Bewegung denken, wenn wir an, auch an die geradezu atheistischen Fragmente eines Euripides denken, die natürlich nie Euripides Meinung ausdrücken müssen, aber die doch ganz klare und auch provokative Formulierungen sind, dann muss man schon sagen, das ist eben etwas, was dann gleich jetzt auch bei Aristoteles weiterlebt, wie ich jetzt inzwischen dem wunderbaren Buch von Mor Segev auch entnehmen konnte. Also das passt hervorragend. Dann spielt dort auch ein Fragment des Aristoteles, das Cicero in den Natura Deorum überliefert eine zentrale Rolle. Wir werden uns in der nächsten Sitzung ja auch mit der antiken Terminologie beschäftigen und eine Etymologie wird bei Cicero von diesem Balbus, dem Stoiker, auch in der Natura Deorum gegeben. Also es fügt sich auch das fast mirakulös in diese Vorlesung mit hinein und ich bin wirklich ganz glücklich, dass wir dich heute hier haben dürfen. Bevor ich äh, Mohr das Wort übergebe, einfach ganz kurz zwei, drei Hinweise zu seinem bisherigen Curriculum. Er ist ja wirklich ein sehr junger Forscher noch, 1987 geboren, hat schon erstaunlich viel zu Wege gebracht und natürlich freut mich als ehemaligen Musiker auch bei ihm im Curriculum zu finden, dass es ein Leben davor gegeben hat mit Musik, wo er die äh, Composition studiert hat an der Ryman School of Contemporary Music. Er hat dann einen BA in Philosophie an der Tel Aviv Universität als erstes Studium gemacht, anschließend an der Universität 
Universität von Haifa einen MA Philosophy und hat dann nach Princeton gewechselt, wo er eben the role of traditional religion in Aristotle als Dissertationsthema äh, verfasst hat und zwar unter der Supervision of John M. Cooper und Alexander Nehamas. Auch das sind natürlich irgendwie Leuchtfiguren, die irgendwie, äh, du schreibst das ja auch im Vorwort, wie dich das und hast es auch gestern gesagt, wie das sofort auch prägend war in diesem Environment, äh, Intellectual Environment von Princeton zu sein. Das ist also das Buch, ich habe es Ihnen ja das letzte Mal auch schon gezeigt, ich zeige es hier noch, damit Sie es auch sehen, eben über, über Zoom und er hat natürlich als Schwerpunkt, er ist jetzt an der University of South Florida und zwar seit 2019 als äh, Associate Professor, er war dort bereits Assistant Professor von 2014 an, also wirklich in sehr jungen Jahren und er ist außerdem auch American Foundation for Greek Language and Culture, Professor of Greek Culture 2020 und Director of the Interdisciplinary Center for Hellenic Studies. Zu seinen Schwerpunkten gehört natürlich die antike Philosophie, aber das geht darüber hinaus. Das sieht man ja auch in diesem Buch, eben Aristotle on Religion. Insbesondere ist ein weiterer Schwerpunkt Medieval Jewish Philosophy, besonders Maimonides und dann auch 19. Jahrhundert, insbesondere Schopenhauer und Nietzsche und ganz generell auch Philosophy of Religion. Seine Artikel berühren sich teilweise eben mit der Thematik der Dissertation, so zum Beispiel ein Artikel, der demnächst in der Classical Philology erscheinen wird, Death, Immortality and the Value of Human Existence in Aristotle's Eudemus Fragment 6, Ross und andere. Was auffällt, die sind alle diese bereits zehn Artikel eben für ein junges Forscherleben wirklich bemerkenswert an exzellenten Stellen auch herausgekommen, wie unter anderem eben Classical Philology oder oder ein, ein American Catholic Philosophical Quarterly, Classical Quarterly, Classical World History of Philosophy, British Journal for the History of Philosophy und natürlich auch für uns Classicists besonders äh, bekannt, auch abgesehen von Classical Quarterly, the Oxford Studies of Ancient Philosophy. Also das ist schon sehr, sehr eindrücklich und er hat eine Reihe von äh, Auszeichnungen und Stipendien bekommen im Rahmen dieses, dieser bisher so brillanten Karriere. Also, lieber Mo, wir sind außer... We are very happy to have you here. He's going to talk in English to us. The questions may easily afterwards be uh, made also in German. The point is that we have learned last time that we should not give the micro to other people, but rather repeat the question then. And I will do that for you. Maybe I will even translate in cases you, you need it. Uh, just tell me. Und für diejenigen, die über Zoom teilnehmen, Sie können Ihre Fragen in den Chat hineinschreiben. Und Benedetta Folletti wird das dann sehen und entsprechend eben diese Fragen auch äh, vorlesen oder mir weiterreichen auch. Also wir freuen uns außerordentlich. We are extremely happy to have you here. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. It's great to spend some time in Zurich and this great intellectual community. I've really been enjoying myself uh, and I'm looking forward to the discussion today. I'm going to talk to you about uh, Aristotle on religion, which is the topic of a book that I published a couple of years ago. Uh, and most of my remarks today are going to be based on this book. In fact, on a couple of chapters within the book. So this is the table of contents from the book and uh, we are only going to touch on a couple of themes and concepts and arguments from the first two chapters. Uh, so in a nutshell, the argument in those chapters is uh, the, as follows. So Aristotle thinks that the content of traditional religion, such as traditional Greek religion and traditional religion elsewhere, uh, in particular, the anthropomorphic or human-like depictions of the gods in such religions, uh, he thinks that all this content of traditional religion is utterly false. He rejects it completely, okay? And we're going to see evidence for this being his view. But then, curiously, at first sight at least, Aristotle also thinks that even though the content of traditional religion is false, even though there aren't any anthropomorphic gods, they don't exist, nevertheless, traditional religion with exactly that same content, okay, 
uh, with that false content is not only useful for political purposes, but actually is absolutely necessary for any political community to exist. You can't have a successful or any political community existing as the kind of thing that it is without traditional religion in it operating and propagating the very content that Aristotle thinks is false. So how can that be the case uh, is the main question that I'll be talking about. And um, in a nutshell, the answer that I'll be giving is that religion is necessary even though its content is false as far as Aristotle is concerned because it prepares citizens in the city or future citizens while they're still children to inquire into philosophical issues and in particular into Aristotelian metaphysics. So for Aristotle, there are gods in existence. They are nothing like those anthropomorphic gods. They're nothing like Zeus or uh, Athena or Poseidon. Okay, they have no human-like characteristics. They're, they have no human intentions or actions or shapes. Um, they are rather, for Aristotle, unmoved movers of the heavenly bodies and spheres. They are the ultimate causes of everything in reality. They, in fact, consist of pure intellectual activity. Okay? So those gods exist, but as it happens for Aristotle, as I'll be arguing, you need traditional religion with those other anthropomorphic fictional gods in order to motivate future citizens to learn about the actually existing gods, to get them to inquire by wandering at uh, and being intrigued by uh, the anthropomorphic gods, to learn about gods in general, gradually progressing toward philosophical knowledge of the gods as they actually exist. Okay, so that's the main argument, and now uh, let's see in a bit more detail how it's going to work. Let me just say, of course, there are other things that are discussed in the book, but we won't have time to go through them, so uh, that's why I have the table of contents in, in on the slide, so you can at least see what else is being discussed there. In terms of a little bit of background, Xenophanes, uh, whom you might have heard of, a pre-Socratic philosopher, um, influenced Aristotle greatly uh, in thinking about traditional religion, thinking about divinity. And so far before Aristotle, Xenophanes already presents a fierce criticism of traditional religion for the anthropomorphism inherent in it, for, those, uh, for depicting gods in those anthropomorphic ways that I mentioned before. So we have Xenophanes in fragments, uh, and here are two fragments that we have uh, by him. So he says, for instance, that Homer and Hesiod assign to the gods all things that are shameful and are a blemish among human beings, uh, things like stealing and adultery and cheating each other, the idea being presumably that the true gods, gods that actually do exist, are not to be thought of as operating in those ways. They're not to be thought of as committing any immoral actions or having any such characteristics, such as wickedness and uh, capability of cheating and so on, right? So we know that those very prominent uh, um, occurrences of such depictions, Homer and Hesiod, after all, are the major source for traditional Greek religion, right? Um, we know that those sources are wrong in the way that they're depicting the gods as far as Xenophanes is concerned. And so traditional religion in general, perhaps, uh, is wrong to depict the gods in those anthropomorphic ways. And we have this idea more fully fleshed out in the following fragment. So he says, if horses had hands or oxen or lions or could paint with their hands and complete works just as men, Horses would paint the forms of gods like horses and oxen like oxen, and they would make bodies such as the frame that each of them themselves had. Right, so the idea here is that the gods that we create, we create in our own image. We can imagine other creatures hypothetically having the capacity to create gods, and those creatures would hypothetically, but uh, probably in such a scenario, uh, they would have created gods that look like them, 
rather than gods that look like us or like other creatures, right? And so what is the probability of us being correct in our depiction? What is the probability of there being a happy coincidence in which one, we depict gods, we have this tendency to depict gods just like we are, looking exactly like ourselves, behaving in similar ways to us, and us also being correct about this, right? Not a very high probability is enough on this point, and so we should at the very least doubt the accuracy of such depictions, right? We should doubt the truth of anthropomorphic depictions of divinity in traditional religions. Now, as I say, this view influenced Aristotle tremendously, and we can see that in the extant corpus. Now, before we get there, let me say something about the extant corpus uh, of Aristotle's and um, the parts of it that will be relevant to what I'm going to be talking about next. So the re uh, we'll, we'll be seeing quotes and bits and pieces from all of the underlying texts on this slide, which might look like a lot, and it is a lot, but uh, let me explain to you why it is that nevertheless it makes sense in a one-hour presentation to go through so many texts. Well, Aristotle uh, doesn't have uh, an extant treatise on religion, right? We don't have a text dealing with religion as such. Uh, when your topic, when my topic in this case, is Aristotle on traditional religion, then my task is to go through all of these different uh, treatises and pick and choose um, relevant bits of evidence to reconstruct his overall view on this topic. And so um, we will be talking about some parts of the Parva Naturalia, which are short treatises um, um, related to uh, the anima or on the soul. So these deal with psychological or psychophysiological phenomena, including dreams, uh, which will be the relevant bit for us in a bit. We'll, we'll be talking a, bit, a little bit about parts of the metaphysics, which I mentioned before. We'll be talking about two of the ethics, uh, the Nicomachean ethics and the Eudemian ethics. Uh, the politics will be extremely important. This is where Aristotle describes the ideal polis in the last two books, book seven and eight, where we really get to see what religion would look like under ideal circumstances in his view. And as we'll see, even under such circumstances, he's going to retain traditional religion with that false content or the content that he thinks is false with those uh, gods that we see in traditional Greek religion like Zeus and Athena and so on. Um, okay, also some parts of the poetics and the fragments of the lost works that uh, Christoph mentioned before. Um, we have a fragment that's extremely relevant there uh, from a lost, so Aristotle had all these dialogues published during his lifetime that no longer survive. Uh, and one of them is called On Philosophy. We have fragments, though, from, from some of those dialogues surviving in quotations and paraphrases, sometimes in other languages. In this case, uh, the relevant fragment that I'm talking about is from Cicero, and it's um, preserved in Latin, um, translating the, the original Greek. Um, okay, but we won't actually have time to talk about it uh, in, in detail, but uh, just so you know, this is where it comes from. Uh, and this is what I mean when I talk about Aristotle's dialogues. Okay, so with all of this in mind, let's get back to Xenophanes and how he figures in Aristotle's thought, how he influenced Aristotle on the issue of religion. So Aristotle says the following in the Poetics, and now you're going to see all those bits and pieces from different places in the corpus already at play. He says that the things, uh, this is not a direct quotation, it's my paraphrase, uh, he, he talks about things concerning the gods or things that are being said about the gods by people. And he says that even, when, even if those things are neither what is better to say nor what is true to say, like Xenophanes thinks, and he mentions him explicitly in this uh, passage, nevertheless, they are certainly in accordance with opinion, right? So the idea is that people do talk in those ways about the gods all the time. Traditional religion is prevalent. The ideas, perhaps the beliefs in anthropomorphic gods that don't exist, um, occur all over the place. Uh, and so that doesn't mean that it's true, that any of it is true. That doesn't mean that the content is reliable. It just means that it's there. Uh, and Aristotle's point here is that Xenophanes is right in criticizing the truth, of the, the truth value of, that, uh, of those depictions. Okay, now in the politics, he's getting more concrete about the criticism, even though 
he doesn't mention Xenophanes by name any longer, but you'll definitely, I hope, uh, agree with me that, that uh, Xenophanes is there in the background and his criticism. So Aristotle says, all people say that the gods are ruled by a king for this reason, namely that some of them to this day are, and others in the distant past were, themselves ruled by a king. Just as human beings make the shape of the god similar to their own, thus they also do this in the case of the god's ways of life. Okay, so why do we see Zeus being depicted as king of the gods, which we see? You may have already seen this uh, in, 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 in this course. You may have seen it elsewhere, but of course it's a very prevalent depiction in the sources. You have it in Hesiod, in the Theogony and the works and days. You have it in the Homeric cycle. In the, in, in the uh, Iliad and Odyssey, you have uh, similar descriptions of, of Zeus as uh, Anax or Lord, right? Why do we see those depictions? Aristotle says, following in large part Xenophanes, we see those depictions because that's the way that humans are, <laughs> right? Just as Xenophanes were talking about the, was talking about the shapes of human beings being projected onto those anthropomorphic fictional gods, uh, Aristotle is extending this criticism now to include the ways of life of human beings being projected onto the gods. So political governance, the, uh, for instance, is the, the example that's been given here. Uh, kingship being attributed to the gods because we see it around in human affairs and human politics. So how likely is it to be an accurate rep representation? Not very likely. Right, now, the one of the questions that arises at this point is, who is Aristotle criticizing here exactly? Now, I've just mentioned that this depiction of Zeus as king occurs in the major poets and Hesiod in the places I mentioned in the Homeric cycle. Maybe he's just criticizing the poets, right? And some scholars have argued that this is exactly right. He's only criticizing the poets, but Aristotle would be perfectly fine with representations of an anthropomorphic false nature, well, not false for him, he would be fine, he would be adopting it as true, uh, if it's not the poetic view, but rather the view propagated, let's say, universally or by all people, by, by uh, oral tradition, uh, by, by uh, word of mouth or whatever it might be. And some people have argued this, but I think that it's false. If you look at the evidence from the politics and the passage that we just read, Aristotle begins there by talking about all people. He seems to be describing a universal human tendency that all people share to construct gods of this nature behaving in those ways and doing it illegitimately, right? We all do it, and we are all wrong to do it, um, at least if we take what we're doing to be representative of the truth. As we'll see, he thinks that we actually should be doing th this, we should be propagating such content of traditional religion um, for other reasons. Okay, another major place where Aristotle talks about this type of anthropomorphism inherent in traditional religion is in the metaphysics, and this passage will be recurring in what I go on to discuss, so I will read it in full, um, but um, we will be going back to it, so that's, that's why I'm doing it. So he says there that it's been transmitted to us through the ancients and very old ones, mind you, ancient by comparison to Aristotle, so really, really ancient people, uh, and has been passed on to future generations in the form of a myth that the unmoved movers, so those are those metaphysical gods that I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation that Aristotle actually thinks exist and thinks are gods, so um, it's, it's been transmitted that they are gods and that the divine encloses the whole of nature. Now the rest has been added mythically with a view to persuading the masses and for its usefulness in supporting the laws and bringing about the general advantage. For they say that the gods are human-shaped or resemble certain other animals, and they add other things which are consequent on or similar to those already said. And he continues, if one were to take the first point by itself separately from those additions, namely the point that they think that the first substances, those metaphysical gods, those unmoved movers, are gods, they would be thought to have spoken divinely, right? So that part is true. There are unmoved movers. They are properly called gods. 
This is one take-home lesson from this passage. But whereas that is true, and it's true that people have recognized it back in the past, in ancient times, relative to Aristotle, nothing else that those people said about the gods is true. When they talked about those gods as, let's say, being ruled by a king, to use the example from the politics, or when they talked about them as ha having human shapes or even animal shapes, all of those depictions are completely false. All of those statements about the gods have no truth to them. The only thing that is true is the underlying truth about the existence of those metaphysical beings that are gods. So we see repeatedly Aristotle criticizing anthropomorphism uh, with regard to the gods and the content of tradition and religion that incorporates anthropomorphism as a major core feature. And sometimes it's being more specific than that even. He attacks specific features attributed to the gods in traditional religion, especially maybe in its Greek variety, which is mostly concerned with for obvious reasons, that's in his most immediate environment. So uh, if we might think that the gods rule human affairs or influence human affairs intentionally, just like we interfere with other people's motives and actions intentionally, we would be wrong in thinking so. And so Aristotle says in the Eudemian Ethics that God is not a ruler giving commands. That's not how God operates. The context of that discussion, by the way, uh, has to do with the way in which God is to be understood as ruling the world or as influencing uh, our actions and so on. But it's not intentionally. It's not in the way that we do it. And that's the, that's the key point. Because the only gods that exist have no intentions. They are not human-like. They have no such characteristics. He's also um, very much opposed to the idea of divine providence. So the idea that the gods watch over us and e either punish us for wrongdoings or uh, reward us for good deeds. All of that for him is out the window as well. So in the Eudemian Ethics, in that same treatise, he says about the lucky person that contrary to conventional opinions, so conventionally, that person is thought of as being favored by the gods. And Aristotle says, no, this person is not to be understood uh, as having a god functioning as his good captain. That's not how it works. And he also says about prophetic dreams, this is from the De Divinatione, which is a part of the Power Naturalia, this group of treatises that I mentioned before when I was listing Aristotle's works. Um, he, he, he says some dreams can be used for foretelling the future, okay? We can explain that, perhaps. Uh, but one way in which it is standardly explained and which is the wrong explanation is to think that those dreams are being sent down by the gods. And the explanation that he gives for both of these standard conceptions being wrong is the same explanation. He says, if luck were divinely ordained, if prophetic dreams were really sent down to us by the gods, then we would have expected the very best people in existence, the very best, most virtuous, smartest people around to be the recipients of those benefits. But what in practice do we see? When somebody is lucky, are they necessarily virtuous? When we talk about somebody who has had a prophetic revelation in a dream. Is that person particularly smart necessarily? Aristotle says no. Those phenomena are perfectly compatible with the person re uh, receiving those uh, benefits being wretched, being vicious, being stupid, right? Those benefits seem to be distributed completely at random. And so it's very unlikely that the gods are involved that the gods intentionally are responsible directly for those benefits being conferred upon certain human beings. And then we have this fragment that I mentioned before from the De Philosophia, from On Philosophy, this lost dialogue that Aristotle wrote and that we have some fragments of where Aristotle attacks. And it's a very interesting fragment. Um, it, it would take a long time to go through it. I encourage you to look at it on your own. It's, all, it's discussed 
uh, elaborately in my book. Maybe we can go back to it uh, during the discussion session. But anyway, uh, in a nutshell, Aristotle is rejecting their, in m the way I read it, um, a standard argument for the existence of gods that would have exhibited divine providence. So that, that is the standard, that, that is the argument that is called the standard teleological argument for the existence of God, starting from certain benefits that we see in nature for human beings and concluding from that, um, uh, or so certain intricate uh, um, structures in nature and um, functioning of things in nature and concluding from those that gods exist as the intentional creators or designers of such phenomena, maybe for our benefit. Aristotle rejects that in, in, uh, in this fragment, uh, at least in the way that I read it, but as, as I say, maybe we'll get to it later. Okay, but you get a general picture of what his view is concerning the content of traditional religion and the basic features attributed to gods in that traditional religion. He thinks that all of it is false. Well, uh, to go back to my original question, if he thinks that it's false, how can he also think that it's necessary? Why would you want, or how could you imagine uh, something that is completely false, uh, has a, a, a content that would seem to be completely useless if what you're looking for is the truth? How can that thing nevertheless be not only useful but absolutely necessary for political structures? And this is Aristotle's view, that you do need traditional religion in order for political community to function. So in the politics, the most relevant place discussing these things, discussing political communities and how they come about and how they operate, he lists necessary supervisions within the city. And one of those is the supervision concerning the gods. And it sounds a lot like the supervision concerned specifically with the traditional gods. So that would be um, a supervision of temples, of sacrifices, of rituals. You have to have that in a city in order for the city to even count as a city. And he's been consistent on this point. This is not a, uh, an accidental occurrence, right? So elsewhere in the politics, he gives us a list of necessary tasks in the polis. One of them is, again, the supervision of religion. I think that this is correlated following some other scholars with also uh, his thought about a necessary part in a polis being the class of priests, which is what you see here signified by the question mark. The reason is that when Aristotle gives us a list of necessary parts in the polis, he actually skips over item six. He lists them numerically, and number six is missing. So uh, the, the conjecture that I favor is that what he must have in mind here is the class of priests. But even without that, the other evidence is clear that you need traditional religion in the city in order for the city to operate. Now, as I mentioned before, this is true not just for any odd city, but it's also true for the best instantiation of political community. The city of our prayers, as Aristotle calls it, and which he describes in the last two books of the politics. So we see here uh, a, a few references to the operation of religion in that ideal city. This is all from book seven of the politics in which, in, uh, in conjunction with book eight, this ideal city is being described. So in that city, you're gonna have um, priests, retired citizens functioning as priests. You're going to have a budget being allocated to costs relating to the gods. You're going to have buildings assigned to the gods, temples, and so on. You're even, have, you're even going to have special permission for art in the religious sphere that is not going to, be, uh, going to be permitted in other contexts. So depictions of unseemly acts that are generally going to be prohibited in the ideal polis that Aristotle is describing gain special permission when the things being depicted are the gods. So Aristotle does not seem certainly to be getting rid of religion, and to me he doesn't seem to be getting rid of traditional religion either. He seems to be keeping religion in its traditional form 
even in his ideal polis. Now, some people have argued that he wants to revise traditional religion to fit the characterization of the gods that he himself gives in the metaphysics. So maybe in the ideal polis, what will be worshipped are not Zeus and Poseidon, but rather the unmoved movers of the heavenly bodies and spheres. Right? That, that has been suggested in the literature, but I, I think that um, the evidence shows the contrary. Certainly there's no positive evidence for any such reform, which should already be a red flag, but also there are uh, quite a bit of places where Aristotle seems to be talking specifically about traditional religion. And we're gonna, we already saw some of them just now, I think, but we're going to see an even more apparent example in a moment. So, now that we see that traditional religion is going to be necessary, even in ideal political circumstances, what is it going to be necessary for, is the question that presents itself. And you already got uh, a preview of what my view on it is going to be, but it's not the only possible answer to the question. So, let me go through a couple of answers possibly to uh, the question of what religion might be necess necessary for in Aristotle's view, uh, answers that I will then object to, and then we'll get to the third one, which I actually support. So one possible answer is that Aristotle thinks that traditional religion is necessary in the city because it's helpful for maintaining social stability. So by traditional religion, politicians, legislators are capable of regulating the behavior of the population, getting them to do what they want and what they should in order for everything to be peaceful and quiet. And we did see that Aristotle thinks religion is useful for that purpose, right? We talked about this uh, passage that I read out to you from the metaphysics from Lambda 8, where Aristotle says quite plainly that those old ancient people introducing those falsehoods, those mythological falsehoods about the gods, uh, did it for the sake of persuading the masses, right? He says that. Presumably they were successful in doing so, so religion is useful for that purpose. Now, we have an instance of Aristotle actually suggesting that the legislator should do that, even in the ideal city. So going back to the politics, to book seven, we have there an occurrence of Aristotle saying that the legislator could mandate a daily walk to pregnant women to the temple of the goddess responsible for childbirth, presumably Artemis, with the intention of getting them to exercise, which they need to in order to maintain their health. Okay, so this is a case of regulating people's behavior by traditional religion in the ideal city of all places, right? So this is, by the way, the evidence that I alluded to a minute ago, uh, further evidence for it being specifically traditional religion that Aristotle is keeping in the ideal city rather than some rarefied, revised version of it. Okay, so you have all of those instances of Aristotle quite plainly saying that religion is useful for maintaining social stability. Some people have understandably suggested that this might be the function that he attributes to traditional religion, the necessary natural function that he thinks religion uh, should be kept for in any city. But I think that that's uh, misguided because there's no real reason for thinking that even though it's useful, even though religion is useful for that purpose, there's no reason to think that it would be necessary to have religion in order to have that function performed. Right? So you may well imagine social stability being maintained in the city through other means. Let's say instead of fear by fear of the gods, uh, you can have the citizens or the population be fearful of punishment by the state, or you can have some sort of a reward system instead of a fear-based uh, uh, punishment uh, institution and so on, or other means. Uh, you, can, you can, I'm sure, think about um, ways of doing it on your own that would not involve the introduction of false depictions of divinity uh, and um, the institutions related to them or propagating them. So it doesn't seem that religion is necessary, even though it's useful for this reason. And so we can give another reason on Aristotle's behalf, which I'm going to reject as well, as I mentioned. Uh, the other possibility is that religion is necessary in order to cultivate character virtue. 
Now, Aristotle does say in the Nicomachean Ethics that the gods and what he talks about there, specifically the traditional gods, and we know that by the example that he gives, so gods and heroes, that's already an indication that he talks about heroes, and the example that he gives is of Hector, uh, the prince of Troy. Right? So he says those beings, as they're depicted in traditional religion, presumably, are excessively virtuous. They have character virtue. Character virtue for Aristotle includes such things as courage and justice and moderation and so on. Those beings have that to a, uh, an excessive degree, uh, which is um, interesting because, generally speaking, an excess from virtue would be a vice, uh, but, uh, but um, I in this case, they're just very, very, very virtuous agents, right? And so the idea would be that on this proposal, by looking at somebody like Hector or reading about him or hearing uh, a poem being recited about him, one is associating oneself with a very virtuous role model, an exemplar of virtuous character and behavior, and that in turn helps oneself uh, to be habituated properly uh, into becoming um, a virtuous agent oneself, right? So the person imitates the virtuous exemplars, the virtuous models, and then they eventually become virtuous themselves. And okay, that might be true. That might be useful for doing that. Um, in fact, I don't think, though, that, again, th this could function as the necessary function of traditional religion. Because, first of all, it's not clear to me that you need role models at all in Aristotle's ethics for more moral habituation to go on. This is somewhat of a controversial topic. Some people think that you do need uh, the imitation of role models for that process. But let's say, for the sake of argument, that you do need them. Why would you necessarily need divine role models? Why wouldn't human role models be sufficient? And they don't even have to be actually existing human beings. What about fictional human beings, but at least of the kind of being that actually can exist, unlike those fictional gods or heroes? Right. Um, OK. So if that suggestion doesn't work either, the last suggestion might. <laughs> I hope so. That's the one that I argue for in the book. So uh, this is the third suggestion in a, in a uh, nutshell. I mentioned it before. Uh, it's the suggestion that what religion is necessary for is the um, motivation toward inquiry into philosophy, in particular into what Aristotle calls first philosophy, which is metaphysics. So getting to know ultimately such things as the nature of those gods that Aristotle thinks actually exist like the unmoved movers of the heavens. Going back to our favorite passage from Metaphysics Lambda 8 that we already went back to a couple of times, you'll remember that the ancient and old people being described there are calling those very beings gods and attribute to them all sorts of false fictional characteristics human-like characteristics, animal-like characteristics, and so on. Now, nowhere in this passage, notice, does Aristotle say that those very old people invent those devices, that they come up with traditional religion. They don't, presumably. Aristotle shouldn't say that because he's committed, based on the politics passage that we started out with, to the view that there's a human general universal tendency to come up with such depictions. Traditional religion results from a tendency that we all share, a proclivity that we all share. So those old ones, those ancient people, presumably had the traditional religion already functioning around them. Then they discovered at some point the existence of Aristotelian unmoved movers, of Aristotelian gods, and they said to themselves, oh, okay, let's take those existing devices, those existing mythological depictions of divinity that are already there and attribute them to those beings that we've now discovered the actual existence of. And the question would be, why did they do that? One possible answer, and we'll see that there's evidence for that in a moment, is that they did that in order for other people to get to that place, in order for, in order for other people to get to know the truth of Aristotelian metaphysics. 
to get other people to inquire philosophically and actually get to grasp the nature of the gods that actually do exist by first being confronted with traditional anthropomorphic gods. Now, before I get to the evidence of how, of, of uh, the evidence for that actually being Aristotle's view, one question that immediately presents itself is why would that be a necessary thing for the polis to, for the uh, city state to accomplish? Why do we even need philosophical knowledge in the city in order for the city to count as such, right? We were talking about, we're trying to find a function for traditional religion that would be absolutely necessary for any polis to count as a polis, for any political community to count as such and to be operative. But why can't we just think of a political community that exists and that even maybe flourishes without philosophical activity going on within it, with none of its citizens being philosophers? Well, as it happens for Aristotle, it actually is necessary to have philosophical activity in the city or at least to have the provisions for philosophical activity in the city, as Cooper puts it in this um, uh, text that I cite at the end of this slide. Well, um, Aristotle thinks that the political community is something that comes about for the sake of mere survival, right? We aggregate into political communities in order to secure our life, our uh, mutual life and uh, our futures. But then once political community is there, it exists for the sake of something further than just that. It exists for the sake of well-being, as he puts it in the politics. What that means for him is that the polis exists for the sake of what he calls eudaimonia, uh, flourishing, happiness. And what that primarily consists of for him in its most perfect sense just is philosophical theoretical contemplation, as we know from the ethics. So we need philosophical activity and we need primarily, most of all, uh, in the best kind of city, philosophical activity, especially in the best kind of city, uh, philosophical activity with its objects being the gods of Aristotle's metaphysics, because those are the basic fundamental causes of all of reality. They are the most honorable objects of philosophical inquiry. And you have to have knowledge of them in order to have complete comprehensive knowledge of philosophy. So the idea is that traditional religion, if it really is necessary in order to get to that point, in order to have at least some citizens be in possession of such knowledge, it would be absolutely necessary for the polis. Because the polis, as I say again, following Cooper, it has to have that kind of provision. All right. Now, as it turns out, we do have evidence for that being Aristotle's view. And some of it is interestingly from outside of Aristotle. So you see a passage, I don't know if it's, is this legible? It's a bit smaller. Um, it's from Strabo, the later historian working after Aristotle, and quoting him um, or, or referring, uh, paraphrasing his ideas quite often. In this fragment, in, in this passage, we, we're going to see a lot of references back to Aristotle. Uh, and uh, this is not an isolated occurrence. In fact, Strabo is one of the sources for some of the fragments that I mentioned before that we have uh, preserved from Aristotle's lost works. Editors uh, sometimes choose Strabo as a source even when Aristotle is not mentioned because there's such a clear connection, at least in their mind, between what Strabo is saying and what Aristotle's view elsewhere is. Okay, and here uh, in this passage we get a very clear example of that, uh, of those types of connection. So he says, Strabo, that it was not only the poets who accepted the myths, but the city-states and the lawgivers also did so, and long beforehand, for the sake of their usefulness, having glimpsed into the natural condition of ra the rational animal. Already this is reminiscent of the fragment from the metaphysics that we keep getting back to from Lambda 8 about the very ancient and old people who have used traditional religion for their own political purposes, right? And those connections, by the way, have been noticed by scholars before that, that I'm going to go through and that I just went through. He goes on to say, for man is a lover of knowledge and the beginning of this is being a lover of myths. Now, again, as has been noticed, the first sentence of Aristotle's metaphysics is uh, to the effect that a human being is by nature um, desirous of, of, of knowledge. 
Uh, and a lover of myth is a concept that Aristotle also talks about in the metaphysics. So this is all infused with Aristotelian ideas and concepts. It is thence then that children begin to attend to and to further partake themselves in discourse. The reason is that the myth is a sort of a new language telling them not of established facts, but of other things besides. And whenever you add the wonderful, you increase the pleasure. At the beginning then, it is necessary to make use of such baits. And as the children come of age, one must guide them toward learning of true facts once the intelligence develops and is no longer in need of flatterers. Okay, so Strabo is telling, her, uh, telling us here that it's necessary actually to use mythology in order to get children to learn about whatever it is that you want them to learn about. Uh, and he says that that's the case because mythology is fraught with what he calls the wonderful, to thaumaston in Greek, okay? It's going to be important for what follows. Aristotle talks about the wonderful, about wonder, quite a bit in the metaphysics in the context of discussing um, philosophical inquiry. So he says that in this part of metaphysics alpha two, that it's by wandering first that things ready to hand that human beings began and still begin to philosophize. And he gives examples, right? You wander about the moon, you start inquiring about it. You wander about the sun, start inquiring about that. You wander about the genesis of the entire world and you start inquiring and learning about that. It all begins with wonder about the particular subject matter. Now myths are composed of wonders, as he also says in the metaphysics, sorry, in the poetics. Uh, he says that they are fraught with the wonderful, totaumaston, the very same wording that was used by Strabo, okay? And he tells us in the rhetoric that wandering at something implies the desire to learn about that thing and that we are most prone to enjoying learning about things that are like ourselves, like anthropomorphic gods, for instance, right, who very much are designed to be like ourselves. So if you combine all of these ideas together, it seems the view seems to emerge that for Aristotle, you need wonder in order to inquire about anything, so you need wonder in order to inquire about the gods. Myths are just the right type of thing in order to get that wonder going, because they are wonderful inherently, and they are about the relevant subject matter. They are about the gods. And so those would be the things being used by traditional religion uh, for its necessary purpose in bringing future citizens to wonder about the gods and start to inquire about them philosophically, which, uh, based on human psychology, as Aristotle understands it, is the necessary way to go. So I read Strabo then as following Aristotle directly on this point, just as on the previous point that I mentioned before the, when, I, when I started reading this passage. Right, okay. Um, so this then would be the function of traditional religion that I think actually um, was um, the one that Aristotle himself attributed to, to this phenomenon. Um, and this, in summary, is what, is what uh, I discuss in, in, uh, in those parts of the book, the first couple of chapters that this whole presentation was based on. Um, do I have a couple of more minutes to talk? Okay, good. So uh, I just wanted to give you a, a glimpse into what comes next because some crucial things are left out of this project and are being uh, investigated by me in, in, in later research that I want to share with you briefly just to end with. So you'll notice that one thing that I haven't talked about, and that's because my book was about traditional religion in particular, um, I haven't talked about the attitude that one should have toward not the gods of traditional religion, not those fictional mythological beings, but rather the actual beings that Aristotle thinks are gods and do exist, the unmoved movers of the heavenly bodies and spheres, the true gods of Aristotle's system, 
I haven't talked about what kind of attitude we should have toward them once we do become philosophers, once we do get philosophical knowledge. But that's, of course, an important question um, for un understanding Aristotle comprehensively on these issues. And so that's what I talk about in those subsequent works. So I have a recent paper about it, and uh, that's the basis for a part of a book that I'm also working on. And just to briefly um, say something about it, I think that a key uh, for understanding the type of attitude that we should have toward divinity in Aristotle's view is the relationship that he calls philia, or friendship as it's standardly translated. Now that's a, certain, that's a rather complicated concept in Aristotle's uh, ethics. There are three, in fact, kinds of it, kinds of philia. Uh, the most perfect uh, one of which, he says, is the one that occurs between people of similar uh, characters, in particular virtuous characters. And he sometimes talks about this relationship, in fact defines it as a kind of equality, right? So in a, a type of equality between two people with roughly this, uh, the same, let's say, level of virtue. But uh, sometimes there are exceptional cases. Sometimes there is friendship or philia obtaining between two unequal parties. So there's superiority friendship, and Aristotle acknowledges those cases and talks about them. So the friendship obtaining, let's say, between a king and his subjects, or between a father and his sons, those are instances of such superiority friendship as opposed to equal friendship or friendship between equals. Now, as it happens, one of the cases for superiority friendship just is the relationship between us and the gods. But... Um, Whereas in those other cases I mentioned, between superior and inferior human beings, the idea is that both parties love each other or contribute to the friendship, as it were, so as to get uh, equality um, approximated. That is to say, the inferior party will be doing much more loving than the superior party uh, in order to make up for his or her inferiority, uh, but still the superior party will love them to some extent as well. And so the relevant proportion will be obtained and equality will be achieved. In the case of friendship between human beings and gods, the disparity is so huge, gods are so far above us in rank and in value that we can't expect that to happen. We can't expect the gods to love us um, and for us to love them enough for, in order for some sort of equality to be achieved in that way. So what happens? What is the appropriate attitude to take? Well, we love them. We contribute to the friendship, to this relationship as much as we possibly can, perhaps dedicating our lives to that through philosophical investigation, through becoming philosophers in the Aristotelian sense. And the gods do nothing. <laughs> the gods don't do anything, which is all for the better because they can't love us anyway, right? For Aristotle, they aren't human-like. They are not capable of human-like passion or love or friendship. So the relationship is just as we would expect it to be. It's unreciprocated. We love them as much as we can. They don't love us at all. And some sort of approximation of, uh, of um, equality is being achieved as a result, at least the, the closest that we can get to it. Okay, so I, I'll leave it there. There's more obviously going on in that research. We can talk about it in the Q&A if you'd like, but uh, thank you once again for having me. Well, many, many thanks for this extremely stimulating and wide-ranging paper. I think this is really beautiful to hear that, how you present it from your uh, thorough investigation. And I was in particular also struck by the fact how naturally Aristotle introduces this epimeleia peritus deus into his uh, ideal city. Because we have been looking in the last uh, session of this vorlesung into a very uh, interesting and highly informative inscription from course, uh, a religious calendar, and the details of this religious behavior and everything. And I mean, it's almost like also mirroring that when he says, also you need these priests, it's, it's essential, like it's the army is essential and the priests are essential for his ideal city. 
city and of course also the constructions of temples are essentials and you have people who look after them that they are not going to collapse all the time <laughs> and things like that that's really very fascinating and it's another one of elements that uh, ties your fantastic lecture back to what we have been doing here already before but let's start the discussion and we have also here the possibility then uh, of having questions from the the chat and we have here already a question uh, may i ask you uh, george astrati how do you think his first principle of the universe in metaphysics 12 aristotle quoting homeric eudesis but beings do not wish to be governed badly the ruler of many is not good let there be one ruler is to be assessed in the context of his reflection on divine providence thank you very much yeah. Agaton polykoiranie heis koiranos esto, <laughs> the famous Homeric phrase. Sure. For the uh, monism. <laughs> yeah, no, good, thanks. Uh, Aristotle, so, right, so in inevitably we're led to some of the parts of the book that I had to leave out. Um, Aristotle uses myths uh, and uh, poetic occurrences of, of mythological depictions of gods all over the place. Uh, and I have an entire chapter in the book talking about those the fourth chapter, uh, and very often he talks about them as allegories uh, useful for, uh, for, for, for uh, unfolding or elaborating on certain ideas that he has um, about gods that actually do exist, but not only about the gods, also about political matters and also about other things. Um, but uh, yeah, the paradigmatic occurrence of that, and it doesn't only occur in the metaphysics, it occurs in uh, uh, the Kylo and elsewhere, is uh, the, the way that he talks about um, uh, the, the gods that he thinks actually exist, the gods that figure in his metaphysical system. And he uses sometimes, uh, let's say, Homer's depiction of Z uh, Zeus, or in, in another place he talks about Atlas, uh, and he's talking about the, uh, him as, as, um, as useful for uh, illustrating certain philosophical ideas that he has about the heavens, about the unmoved movers of the heavens. Um, and that's all well and, and good. Uh, that doesn't mean that he thinks that any of that is true, uh, right? So, so um, uh, I think that the evidence is overwhelming that he thinks of those depictions as all being false, but precisely because they are useful in the ways that I've indicated for philosophical inquiry to be motivated, to be, um, um, to be uh, encouraged, uh, it's exactly what you would expect, right, for him to be using those myths uh, in, in philosophical investigation, philosophical exposition. Remember, those are the treatises that we have left from us all, basically lecture notes um, uh, used for instructive purposes, for instructional purposes. And so uh, very um, unsurprising to me that he would be using those, those, uh, those devices uh, in order to be um, introducing things that are, at the end of the day, quite unrelated to them, uh, to the content that they present. Uh, at the end of the day, quite uh, detached from uh, the mythological content that is being used for those il you know, illustrative purposes, just as those ancient and very old ones uh, depicted in Metaphysics Number 8 did when they were talking about the unmoved movers as having human shapes and animal shapes and so on. Yeah, so divine providence, uh, unfortunately, I think for him is, is out of the question uh, in, in the last analysis. And I will then again repeat it after für diejenigen im Zoom, wir müssen eben die Fragen wiederholen nachher. Sie werden das schlecht hören. Yeah, very good. Um, thank you for pausing after the first one, because also when, when people ask kurz me... Wiederholen eben, also die, die Frage is enabling uh, philosophical education as the function of religion, and hangs also with that, that children then first come with abstraction in contact. Kommen. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I was just going to thank you for pausing after the first one, because when, when people ask me two questions in a row, I usually forget one of them in the process, if not both. Uh, so, uh, yeah. It's um, the issue of abstraction is, is interesting. So on the one hand, precisely what we see Aristotle's view as being is that what you need is at first the, the exposition of something uh, uh, 
um, you know, the, the opposite of abstraction, like the very concrete uh, illustrations of the gods as, as looking exactly like, like we do and, and behaving in the ways that we do. And then, then, as you say, uh, as the process um, moves forward, the expectation is for them to be able to get rid of that uh, um, and, and, and to be left with uh, something that we might call abstract, at least insofar as it's abstracted of any material features. After all, this unmoved mover, um, th this type of being, as, as I mentioned at the, the outset, is a pure intellect that has no material characteristics and no, especially n n nothing like uh, anything um, um, like a human shape or anything of that sort, um, or being politically governed by a king. So there is abstraction going on in, 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 in that sense. Now, again, I, I have to say something about a, a different part of the book like I did with the previous question, because uh, the third chapter in the book deals precisely with what it is that happens, what it is that is useful in those uh, mythological gods, which you're right, I haven't gotten to in, uh, in detail because it would have been, um, it would have taken us too far astray. But uh, it, the question is exactly on target. In fact, exactly after talking about what I talked about today in the book, I go on to the third chapter dealing exactly with that question. So in a nutshell, the idea is that what is, mostly useful about the traditional gods being the way that they are is that they help us uh, to relate to divinity. Uh, they help us to uh, attach ourselves to that concept by, again, being close, as close to us as possible. By, uh, they share the definition both with us and with uh, the gods that actually do exist, and so they form a middle ground between us and them. Uh, otherwise, the abstraction, as you put, would have been just um, too incomprehensible, too uh, out there, as it were, for, for people to be able to grasp uh, or come to terms with at the outset. So I, I, hope, I'm, I'm, I, I hope I'm conveying a picture of in, in what sense abstraction is going on as, as, as the process proceeds, but the idea is that by associating ourselves with the beings that are so somehow intermediate, yeah, we gradually uh, as, uh, associate ourselves with the concept of divinity and then toss away, abstracting, if you will, uh, human-like features and, and, and stay with what um, the gods essentially are. And by the way, I should say, and also that's discussed in that third chapter, we're also left with essentially what we are. A part of the, abstract, um, the abstraction, as we'll call it uh, for the sake of uh, me answering your question, uh, is understanding that what human beings essentially are, um, and that's something that he says explicitly at the end of the Nicomachean Ethics, um, is noose just like those unmoved movers. So the reason why we can even get to know them, what it means for us when we get to know them, what, what that amounts to, is for us not only to know them as an object of inquiry, uh, but we actually approximate their condition. We become, for the time being, while we contemplate the activity of the gods, we become that um, um, type of being. We, we, we um, imitate the divine, we approximate it, um, and that, of course, led to a whole bunch of um, theological ideas about imitatio dei, the imitation of the divine, um, largely following, um, I would say, Aristotle. You would maybe say Plato, <laughs> even <laughs> before Aristotle, but yeah. Um, right, so, so um, I, I, I hope I'm answering your question, but uh, then you had an, uh, another one after that. Yeah.
Ja, äh, Darf ich die Frage zunächst noch wiederholen? Äh, eben die Frage nach der sozialen Stabilisierungsfunktion von Religion. Also warum ist das in Aristoteles Sicht notwendig? Weil eben Mosegef im Vortrag sagt, man könnte sich auch andere Elemente vorstellen. Und der Fragen, Herr Steiner meint, aber das ist irgendwie sehr viel effektiver, wenn man etwas, eine so hohe Autorität hat, die Aushab ist. Das ist ja im Übrigen auch aktuell hoch intensiv diskutiert, Böckenförde und so weiter. Der Staat braucht die Gesetze, brauchen auch Voraussetzungen, die sie selber nicht garantieren können und so weiter. Aber ja. Very good. Uh, I, I almost was about to begin with the last point I just made as an answer to your question. They can, co they do coexist, but they're not both necessary. And what you're saying is exactly right. Uh, It's, it's, it's very useful, and as I, uh, I was emphatic on, Aristotle gives us every reason to think that he thinks that it's very, very useful and effective to use religion for the purpose of achieving social stability and regulating people's behavior. He gives us recommendations in the ideal city to do that, so of course he thinks it's effective. What we're looking for, though, is not just any useful feature of religion, but what religion is absolutely necessary for. What you couldn't have a polis without religion in it. Um, um, what, 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 you, what you couldn't do without in a polis. Um, and so uh, that's something that you, that, that, that's uh, uh, a device that is simply very useful, would simply not do, would simply not be good enough to answer that particular question. Now, because it's so effective, because it's so useful, we do expect Aristotle to be making use of it in his own political theory, and indeed he does. Uh, as, as well he should. And there are other usages uh, of, of myths that he thinks are there. Um, I'm, I'm all for, uh, even though we have less explicit evidence for that in Aristotle, I'm all for thinking that it may very well be the case that it's also useful to have traditional religion in order to cultivate one's character, which is the second um, function that I was proposing. But what we're looking for is specifically something that is absolutely um, necessary uh, and that you couldn't Uh, have a city um, without religion in it, um, um, y y uh, something that you absolutely need religion for, uh, and, and, and that uh, without having religion perform that function, a city would just not be the kind of thing that it is. Yeah. Dietrich. Right. Well, Die Frage yeah. zielt nach, von Herrn Dietrich zielt nach der Notwendigkeit von Mythen für die Auslösung eben die, dieses philosophischen Neugierdeprozesses und des weiteren Wissenwollens, weil Sie davon ausgehen, dass eigentlich eben in, diese, in diesem Erkenntnisstreben, das Aristoteles an, als anthropologische Konstante betrachtet, das schon so stark angelegt wäre, dass es die Mythen gar nicht richtig braucht. Habe ich Sie richtig verdeutlicht? Oder? Also jedenfalls, Sie möchten, dass er mehr zu den Mythen sagt und ihr philosophischen ihrem philosophischen nutzen thank you so much uh, it's a really good question let me emphasize uh, that you cannot for aristotle achieve metaphysical knowledge without physical knowledge uh, without knowledge of the natural world in a very comprehensive systematic 
way. Uh, he's clear in the metaphysics and elsewhere about the stages of, of, uh, of inquiry that, that um, must necessarily be followed in order for anybody to count as a philosopher, for anybody to achieve properly the kind of knowledge that at the very end uh, is being um, sought after uh, in, in Aristotle's view. Um, so you need experience, you need perception, and by the way, you need them also uh, for absorbing uh, data about traditional gods as they're propagated by, you know, you're looking at statues of them, you're hearing stories about them and so on. Of course, that involves perception as well. Um, the issue, the crux of the issue is what is it that gets people to wonder about the relevant thing, right? Um, and so you can just look at the examples that he gives uh, for the type of thing that initiates wonder uh, culminating in inquiry about this or that subject matter. And uh, I gave that passage um, before where, where he gives those examples, but some of them are examples of perceptible objects. So the moon, let's say. You look up at the moon, uh, literally you observe it and, and wonder is being engendered, right? You want, what is this thing up there that I'm looking at right now? And you, you want to inquire into it, you want to learn about it uh, and, and, uh, and grasp its nature to the best of your ability. Same with many other things in, in uh, you know, observable uh, natural phenomena in, in the world and so on. Uh, you look at them and, and wonder is sort of easily automatically generated as a result of pure observation. Um, we do, though, uh, find ourselves being left with the most important objects of inquiry, which are the gods. That's what he says in the, actually in, meta, in the beginning, um, uh, in the first book of the metaphysics, he talks about the gods as being the most honorable uh, objects of inquiry, uh, and, and so we need to wonder about them and in order to inquire about them, just as we need to wonder about anything in order to inquire about anything. Now, you're right, we can wonder about being and we can inquire into being, but m m you know, um, M m many things uh, are or exist in the world, many things have being, and so you need specifically the wonder at that thing, presumably based on the overall theory that he has of philosophical inquiry and philosophical education, uh, in order to finally find yourself inquiring into that specific thing. And so since these things, as it happens, are gods for him, and by the way, that is all over the place in the metaphysics in Lambda, he talks about Nous as God, he talks about the unmoved movers as, as divinity, as divine, uh, as eternal living things and so on. So uh, you need to find a way to get people to wonder at gods, generally speaking, so that at one point they'll be in a position to transition to learning about those specific beings. And the claim is anyway that, that the best way, of the, the, the actually necessary way uh, of, of uh, doing so given human psychology and how we learn about things and how uh, we enjoy learning about things uh, is, is through the mythological depictions of the gods in, in traditional religion. But, but, but pr um, what you said about perception is absolutely correct mm -hmm. in Aristotle's view. Yeah. Waren hier Fragen, hat mir Benedikt gesagt, Anna Schriebel. Maybe we can start with that and then move on to the other one. Yeah. Also ganz kurz zusammengefasst eigentlich einfach fragt Anna Schriefel, welches ist die Funktion der traditionellen Religion, wenn man bereits zur philosophischen Erkenntnis gekommen ist? Hat es dann überhaupt noch einen Sinn oder nicht? Thank you. Um, yes. So 
Not everybody's going to be a philosopher in Aristotle's uh, polis, even in the ideal polis, and that's a very unfortunate fact, but it is a fact. Um, so the citizen body is going to be very tiny by comparison to the gener general population. Uh, women are not going to be citizens. Uh, slaves are not going to be citizens, and there are going to be plenty of them. Uh, hired workers who are not citizens are going to be all around. And none of these people are going to be expected to be uh, capable of or to have the access to philosophical education or knowledge. That's Aristotle's vision for the best city, unfortunately, right? Um, now, the city functions with traditional religion in it. By the way, even in the citizenry, not everybody's going to be a philosopher, it seems. There's some controversy about that. All citizens in the ideal polis are expected to be virtuous, but there's more virtue than one in Aristotle. We talked about uh, virtues of character, uh, like courage and moderation. It could be that those would be maybe enough for most citizens, and then a select few will also be capable of having theoretical wisdom and, and be real fully-fledged philosophers in uh, possession of knowledge of the gods of Aristotle's metaphysics and so on. Okay, so very, very elite group. But religion is for everyone in the city. That's absolutely right. And so if the necessary function of traditional religion only pertains to the select few, how do we square those, those bits? Well, it's true that it's going to be a select few, even in the ideal city, who practice philosophy, and that in that sense, it's only them who are going to be the direct beneficiaries of the function of traditional religion, as I see it. Nevertheless, it's a crucially important thing for the polis, as I uh, tried to argue before, uh, to have philosophical activity within it, even if it's only a select few who actually practice it. It's paramount for a polis to exhibit that accomplishment, and John Cooper, who I mentioned before, has um, uh, views about the way in which uh, it trickles down, as it were, this benefit to the rest of society by association. B uh, let's say you're um, a, a hired worker uh, farming um, a field that would um, nourish a philosopher. Well, you're engaged in, uh, in, 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 in a great project, in a sense, where you're contributing to, to the best possible human activity, even if only indirectly in the way that you're capable of. Uh, now, the political community is, um, is um, of um, uh, a, a unified purpose and, and, and goal. In my personal view, it also has its own nature. Uh, some people disagree. But in any event, uh, if you think of that, that goal being primarily uh, at the highest level, philosophical contemplation, then the fact that most people are not go going to be engaged in it is going, not going to interfere with that being a necessary function to be performed in the city. Now, as it happens, we also, to go back to uh, a previous question about social stability being very useful and compatible with this other usage, we also have the happy accident that religion is going to be useful for all those other purposes. So yeah, if we had religion, um, uh, if we had uh, a case in which religion were both necessary for political purposes and destructive of social stability, then that, that would be a real clash and something for us to consider and for Aristotle to re-examine his, his views as a result of. But that's not the case. As it happens, religion is useful for all of these purposes, right? So you can have it perform its function uh, for motivating intellectual philosophical activity and inquiry in, in those people who are aware of it. Uh, and then you have uh, all of the... Um, uh, rest of the benefits added on to that of people having their behavior regulated as a result of traditional myths and so on. Now, uh, a part of your question had to do with the uh, openness in which Aristotle talks about his criticism of uh, traditional religion. Uh, and, and, and that's a good point. Um, to what extent do we want people whose behavior is to be regulated by the gods to what extent do we want them to know that those gods that they are fearful of don't actually exist, right? Well, presumably, the relevant people will not be uh, ac accessing in the ideal city uh, the, the, the type of um, uh, data, that they will not be receiving that curriculum, there will not be students in Aristotle's class, um, and, and um, arguably, even if they are, th there could still be a social benefit uh, to having stories propagated about the gods without anybody believing in them. 
But if that's not the case, then okay. Then we don't have that social stability benefit, but we still have the necessary function for which traditional religion is useful. And we, and we, can, use, uh, we can get the stability through other means, as I said before, by uh, state punishment or whatever it might be. May I immediately add an, an aspect, which, because I have to say that sometimes I feel a little bit uneasy in using always the rigorous categories of true and false. Because with traditional religion, we are not in the realm of episteme. We are in the realm of endoxa. And in the realm of endoxa, where there is only a, a, an assumption, a conjecture about what is going on, you don't have true and false. And therefore, I think I would read some passages really slightly in a different way. Because if we read it, and your question, Anna, goes a little bit in this direction, with the rigor of true and false, then he becomes utterly cynical. I mean. This is for the poor ones, for the poor spirited. And of course, we have similar ideas in a way also in the tradition, let's say, of origin, where the hablusteri, hablusteroi are unable to go beyond a, a, a literal reading of the Bible and so on. And then the intellectuals are easy to go. But in this case, it means that the literal reading is not wrong. Whereas in your case, it means it is wrong. And I have some doubts about the correctness of this assumption, because if you look in, at this passage in, the, in Lambda 8, mm -hmm. of course he says, when you read it in a philosophical way, the basic assumption, which is however an argumentum ex consensu omnium, is right. That means only you have to be able to read through this, the, the superficial literal meaning. And this is something which had been established by long in the time of Aristotle, that of course, myth, like also myth of, of, of Orpheus and so on, they always have a deeper meaning. And this deeper meaning, which then later was so much insisted on, is really superior and goes back to the origins, to the Palaio and so on. Therefore, I, I feel a little bit uneasy bit about that, even if we look at this passage in the, in the uh, politics also at the beginning. It it is, to me, less criticizing than analytical that we behave like that. When we have to say something about religion, a traditional religion, of course we come from our own background. And we have also, I think, for the providence to make a difference whether we are talking about the sublunar or the supralunar element. And if you look at the stars and so on, they are in the supralunar realm, where there is some kind of episteme already achieved. And therefore, I really, but it's probably too much to do it here, I would also like to, uh, to talk about this uh, argumentation on this passage in Cicero, whether it's really a negation of providence or not, because I think providence is not equal to providence. And of course, everybody, everybody has to do it. Yourself, as you said also, I mean, we are, Human beings, we have the news and we have to work with that news and then we get up, so to say. Uh, but still, I mean, we have this realm where we are. I was wondering also, what does Aristotle say about the daimonia? Actually, he uses the word daimonus when he talks about this, uh, this here race and the, the people caring for the religious realm. And this is at least in the later tradition and already in, in Plato himself, that the traditional pantheon is fitted in on the level of the daimonus, which is a lower ontological level, which probably belongs to the endoxa. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, let me just briefly respond to what you just said, uh, beginning with the last point about daimonion. Uh, he uses the, the adjective daimonion to, to refer to you know, nature in the treatise that I talked about um, uh, when we talked about the dream issue, the prophetic dream, so that divination on divination through sleep is the short treatise about this kind of phenomenon. And he actually, w in the same context of saying that the dreams are not sent by the gods, he talks about dreams as a natural phenomenon and nature responsible for them as daimonion. So that's taken on the, um, uh, that, that very term that you just um, uh, appealed to. And um, as, as regards endox, I would, I, would I, I see your point, but, but and, and I see your point, by the way, about the analysis of the politics passage, and I do agree that by itself it need not be read as a criticism, but then I do link it to the poetics passage in which he does say, uh, that what people say, and that would be endoxa about the gods, is not necessarily the true thing to say, uh, um, uh, or the better thing to say. So, and any, any, you know, um, Aristotle uh, anyway, uh, individually, is, is quite uh, interested in endoxa as a source for truth, and he thinks that we have uh, a human 
uh, universal tendency toward the truth, which leads him to think that actually most of the time this is what is so um, um, intriguing uh, when, when, it, when, when you have cases in which it doesn't fit that paradigm, but it, for the most part, if everybody believes some, if, if there's an endox on a, a, universe, a, a, a prevalent opinion that is universal, that is agreed upon by everyone, uh, then, then that tends for him to be true on that basis. Uh, but, um, yeah. And you had a second question, yes, then and, and a third Asha one. <laughs> Profenko, a question, and uh, maybe someone else, and then we have probably to start thinking of an end. Now, please, come, come on. Yeah, good. Die, die Frage zielt auf die Liebe, die der Mensch dann zur höchsten Gottheit haben kann, während dem eben in der Darstellung von Mosegev die Gottheit selbst diese Liebe sozusagen nicht zurückgibt. Das ist ein Unterschied zum jüdisch-christlichen Tradition <lacht> gewissermaßen. Und eben, also was ist die Basis unserer Liebe zum Göttlichen, weil es uns diese Möglichkeiten schafft, in Eudaimonie auch zu leben, zum Beispiel? Ja, yeah, thanks. So so in the rest of this new er project, uh, I, I exactly go on to discuss these issues of what, how should we unpack this relation of philia that we have toward the gods and that they don't have toward us. Um, and I think that a key concept useful for understanding that is the virtue that Aristotle calls magnanimity uh, or megalopsuchia in Greek, so great souledness. And the great souled person for Aristotle, I think, uh, is, there's some controversy about that, is the philosopher. So as it happens, that person is supposed to be uh, the most suitably concerned with, the most appropriately concerned with honors. That's what the virtue of magnanimity uh, is concerned with. And the magnanimous person, I think, uh, is appropriately concerned with honors because they dedicate their life and efforts and investigation to the most honorable beings in existence, which are the gods of Aristotle's metaphysics. So they are philosophers. Um, that's an interpretation that one need not take with regard to the magnanimous person in Aristotle's view, but it's the interpretation that I take and that others have taken. And so if you take that interpretation, the magnanimous person really gives us a good glimpse into what it means for us to dedicate our life to the divine because Aristotle has a lengthy discussion of the magnanimous person in his ethics. So the magnanimous person is said, for instance, to lower themselves, uh, to look down on uh, everything, uh, including the whole of humanity, including themselves as part of humanity. And I take that to be precisely the idea that uh, one has to um, practice humility, as it were, to, I, I also draw connection to Moses Maimonides and Jewish medieval philosophy, which was just mentioned, uh, in this respect, uh, practice humility w with, with respect to um, uh, the comparison between us and the gods, realizing all the while that we are inferior to them and uh, dedicating our lives as much as possible to contemplating their nature as such. By doing so, we also approximate their condition, as Aristotle thinks. But the important thing is that we uh, realize that we are not um, as valuable as they are. So that's, that's in a nutshell what loving them or dedicating one's life to them consists of. Thank you very much. We have a question here from Kasia Prochenko. Your presentation today has been limited to the criticism of the traditional mythology, which is actually only one and quite superficial aspect of religion. It's almost like to call a criticism of Christianity laughing at people telling the story of Santa Claus. Could you please tell us something more about the attitude of Aristotle towards the views of his intellectual predecessors, especially besides already mentioned Xenophanes, Thales, Anaxagoras and Plato, who also criticized the traditional mythology. Do you think there is something truly new in what he's saying? You have mentioned some fragments where he criticizes Plato. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily call traditional religion superficial. Uh, I think that um, the very, and, and I wouldn't think that Aristotle is 
at the end of the day dismissive of it uh, or thinks of it as being superficial or unimportant. In fact, I mean, the, 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 the main point I was uh, arguing for is that he thinks it's absolutely necessary for philosophical uh, political purposes. So even if only for that reason, having it around is of paramount importance and, and, um, and uh, not to mention those other benefits that it has. Now, as for Aristotle's own views about the gods, well, it's true that, yeah, I, I, I couldn't get it, uh, into it in detail. I started just now to say something uh, about it, uh, but uh, that, that, that would be a talk about, um, I, I suppose, centering on metaphysics, lambda, and, and such, um, which I'm happy to do on another occasion. <laughs> uh, as far as his predecessors are concerned, uh, well, you mentioned Xenophanes in the, que in the question, and yes, I, I focused on his criticism of traditional religion that Aristotle follows, but there are also some similarities between their positive theological views. So interestingly, Xenophanes, after presenting, well, I, I don't know about after, these are all fragments and we don't know the ordering of them or, the, 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 anyway, uh, separately from, in other fragments, uh, uh, different from the ones that I mentioned, uh, we have uh, some of his uh, positive ideas about uh, divinity and how one should conceive of it. So he doesn't toss away the concept, and he does uh, propound his own understanding of the divine to an extent, even though it's quite hard to understand, especially because of the fragmentary nature of the evidence. So he talks about, um, it seems at least, uh, some sort of uh, unified singular God, uh, a sort of monotheism. Uh, and, uh, and he's vehement on the fact that that type of divinity will be fundamentally different from the traditional gods uh, in being non-anthropomorphic. So it would have no human body, no human shape. Uh, it would, he has this fragment where he says that it would be all knowing, all seeing, all hearing and so on. Um, whatever that means uh, is up for interpretation. But um, in some, of course, Aristotle's, th these might just be metaphors, but if they're not, then that would be a deviation from Aristotle's view, or Aristotle's view would be a deviation from it, because Aristotle does not think that the unmoved movers have any sort of sense perception, even though he does think that other gods exist, it seems, which I also discuss in the book, like the heavens, the heavenly bodies themselves, which might partake of perception. So maybe that's not even all that different from Xenophysis' view, but anyway, um, the unmoved mover, this, this pure noose or intellect uh, that, that is the, at least the paradigm for divinity in Aristotle's view, uh, shares some similarities with the concept of, of uh, God that Xenophanes ends up uh, propounding in his own fragment. So there's influence in that direction too. And I agree, one should always keep both of these strands in mind, both the, the attitude of, of this or that philosopher toward traditional ideas about the gods, about institutionalized religion, uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, their own positive theological views. I see one more question, very briefly, uh, and also the answer very briefly. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Eine yeah. sehr interessante Frage, sozusagen fast die Kreter-Frage. Ein Kreter, der sagt, er lügt immer und er wirft eben immer vor, dass die anderen anthropomorph vorgehen, aber wenn er den Nus ins Zentrum stellt, geht er gewissermaßen genauso anthropomorph vor. Wie entkommt er dieser Falle? Yeah, Natürlich mit Platon. <laughs> This is a really, really good question. Um, and it's easy to answer. We don't know what, uh, <laughs> what ourselves the Nus consists of, or at least there's a huge controversy about that. Um, uh, okay, more seriously though, it's, it's not, it's not um, necessarily contradictory in the following sense. Uh, Aristotle uh, thinks that we can approximate the condition of the, of the divine by, by uh, uh, philosophical investigation, and by doing so, we will be um, 
sharing their nature to very temporary uh, uh, durations of time, very, in very imperfect ways, in very sporadic ways, and so it makes all these qualifications. So the human case and the divine case are already already um, uh, differentiated very clearly in the in the text uh, in the, in when he when he said he's, he's very careful when he when he says those things about the capability that we might have of, of sharing in the divine now it's true that he calls the divine intellect or noose but what that means exactly is far from obvious and so there are scholars working on that and and, and some of them think that indeed there's a, a, a one-to-one -one correlation between human noose uh, of the kind of thing that the human I intellect is and the kind of thing the divine intellect is maybe then questions like the one that you uh, are asking uh, be, be becomes uh, become especially relevant but but some people take the view that that uh, there's actually more of like an, an, a nominal uh, uh, equivalent a nominal um, um, similarity or connection that it's, it's they're really only um, uh, given the same name, but at the end of the day, when you really understand what the divine news is for Aristotle, it's something radically and fundamentally different. So I'll just keep, uh, I'll just uh, throw it out there that there is this huge controversy that we really can't go into, but, but, but it's crucial for answering the question that you're raising. I'm happy to talk also after the, the talk uh, further about this. Many, many yeah. thanks to all the people who also have put these fascinating questions. But first of all, of course, to Professor Moaseke for Thank this you. wonderful paper, for this wonderful discussion. And I think many of the topics will come back actually already in the next uh, lecture in a week, because then we will look at uh, the definition of religion Balbus gives in the in the De Natura Deorum. Oh, and yeah. of course, the criticism of anthropomorphism is again very essential. Thank you so much. Thank and you. hope Thank to you see you again much. here in Zurich also with Thank your you. further projects. <laughs> Thank, <laughs> Thank you so much and have a good weekend. Thank you. Thanks. Und allen zu Hause auch. Herzlichen Dank fürs Mittun. Alles Gute.